I started to notice the repetition of one word in particular, and that word is C. And I thought, man, for any of us who are trying to figure out what it looks like to be healthy leaders, seeing is such a critical component. Our sight is Mm -hmm. such a critical component. Welcome to More Than Small Talk. We're Susie Eller, Jennifer Watson, and Holly Gerth, writers and real life friends. We're inviting you to go deeper, become freer, and feel more connected. So imagine you have a cup of coffee, a mug of tea, or a green smoothie in your hand, and we're all hanging out in your favorite place together. Welcome back, More Than Small Talk friends. You are in for a treat this week. We have Sophie Hudson with us, and she has been a blogger since 2005. I was thinking that is almost 20 years. We've been some conferences together back in the day. And she also has a popular podcast called The Big Boo Cast, and she is nicknamed Boo Mama. And if you have not discovered her already, you are late (laughs) (laughs) because she is beloved by many. And she continues to contribute to the world through her words, both written and spoken. And she has a new book called A Fine Sight to See. I love that title. And she's talking about women's leadership. So we are excited about having a conversation with her about that today. Hey, Sophie, tell us why and what led you to write this book for right now. Oh, gosh, y'all. It was a windy road, I would say. (laughs) I've just been thinking a lot over, and I mean, over a period of years, not just, you know, like on a Tuesday, but I had been thinking a whole lot about leadership and the more I, I, I sort of walked through those thoughts, I started thinking a lot about women in leadership and about how we fight a lot about it in our church, yes. <laughs> our church spaces. And uh, I think sometimes that, that fight, I mean, and listen, everybody gets to work it out how they think it ought to be worked out. But I think because of all the the disagreement about it, a lot of times we don't do a lot of encouraging um, and we don't use the language of leadership a lot with women uh, in, in particularly, I would say, in, in some of our, our church spaces. So I was thinking about all that. And I, I also have a longstanding fascination with Moses. And all of this <laughs> came together one day on a flight from Birmingham, where I live, to Houston. And I just thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get on, I'm going to get on this plane and I'm just going to read the book of Exodus because I can't stop thinking about Moses and I can't stop thinking about leadership. So maybe there's something here. And, and sure enough, as I got into the book of Exodus, which by the way, if you had asked me to give odds about how likely mm-hmm. it would be that I would write about the book of Exodus, <laughs> I would have said they were slim to none. I started to notice the repetition of one word in particular, and that word is C. Yeah. You know, all kinds of forms mm-hmm. of it. And it comes up over and over again. And I thought, man, for any of us who are trying to figure out what it looks like to be healthy leaders, seeing is such a critical component. Our sight is mm-hmm. such a critical component. And so it just kind of started there. And it led to a year of writing that was probably the most fun I have had mm-hmm. with that yeah. side of my life. Yeah. So you said that seeing this whole concept of seeing, being seen, that yes. that can shape the way we view ourselves as we step into Christian leadership mm-hmm. or into leadership. How does that help us, Sophie? Yeah, I think there are a couple of, of things that I've thought about a lot about the whole thing about seeing. For, for one, it's not just about how we see ourselves, which we absolutely need to do. I talk in the book about how we need to, we need to ruthlessly self-inventory Um, And ask the Lord to show us Mm -hmm. places where our sight or our vision is compromised. And that can happen a lot of ways, right? With shame, with bitterness, all kinds of things. But I think that the other part of that, and this is where Moses, even in his frustration, uh, was, was such an example for us, is how we see other people. And that first and foremost, we see other people as image bearers yes. of God, and they are not to be dehumanized. Mm-hmm. Um, they are not to be diminished in any way. And yes, people are going to get on our nerves, <laughs> but you know, there's just going to be frustrations. We see Moses several times go like, oh my goodness, like, what am I supposed to do? But he never questions the fact that, well, he does question initially, but once he gets into that journey, 
he knows that that those people are his responsibility and he learns to see them like God does. And that's really all of our Mm -hmm. challenge as well, to see people like God does Mm -hmm. um, and then to see the ways that we're wired to love and serve and lead those people. Mm -hmm. That's good. And you share about a dream that you had repeatedly (laughs) when you're writing this book um, and you're laughing about it. It was Mm -hmm. funny, but it also kind of hit me in the heart, you know, because I think a lot of us, especially as women, can relate to that. So will you tell us about that dream you kept having? (laughs) Listen, it's only funny now, Holly. (laughs) (laughs) I I wrote this book as I was processing some of my own stuff. (laughs) coming out of serving for a long time in vocational ministry. And when I started, this book kind of started to come together in my head. I had these dreams repeatedly where I would be in some room or some space where I was supposed to talk in front of a group of people. You know, maybe it was like at one point it was a, it was an auditorium at the Shriners Hall in my (laughs) so vividly. And uh, to tell you how old I am, I couldn't make anybody hear me. And I walked across the street to a payphone to try to tell <laughs> to try to, to try to tell somebody that that the sound wasn't working. Sometimes I would be in front of a group of people and I couldn't make my voice come out. Like, but mm-hmm. it was just this overwhelming sense of I cannot be heard. I cannot be heard. I cannot be heard. And I think that women understand this. And and listen, we are so conditioned. And I would say in some instances, sorry about the dog. In some instances, gifted at being people who will just go along with whatever the system is, right? Mm -hmm. And we're just, listen, we're going to smile. We're going to be what I call winsomely deferential. We're going to, we're going to get in there. You know, we're going to try to make the best of it. But there's a toll it takes, I think, in our faith spaces when we don't regularly hear the voices of other women. Mm -hmm. And when we don't feel like our voices are valued, and I feel like this book was a way that I actually processed through and worked through and maybe healed a little bit from some of that stuff. Yeah. You've been doing this a a long time. And so have I, I've 20, (laughs) 24 years, 25 years for me as well. And so, you know, there can come a time and this is, this is a question just heart to heart. There can come a time when we feel like our voices are diminishing because we've been doing it a long time or we're getting older or we're 100%. And and so what would you say to that woman about a fine sight to see? <laughs> you know, yeah. what would you say to her? Oh, gosh. You know, one of the things from time to time I would think I'm writing a book about healthy leadership for women and I'm using Moses as my example. You know, like, <laughs> but, but yeah. I mean, we're supposed to learn from everybody in scripture. But sure. I'm going to tell you something. The the end of Moses's life to me, y'all, I, I, I don't want to cry, but it, it makes me cry every time. Mm-hmm. We know that 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 God himself buries Moses in a location mm-hmm. we do not know. But the one of the very last things we learn in scripture about Moses's life, and this is in Deuteronomy, was that his vigor was unabated and his sight was unhindered. Mm-hmm. And I think that is such a reminder to me as I identify more and more with people who are like, I'm tired, you know, <laughs> that it, we're not done. Like we're just not done. It's as long as we're here, God has work for us yeah. and it may change, you know, like we got to be wise. It may change how we use our voices and use our gifts to point people in the direction of, of love and of Jesus. But I think that whole idea of, of continuing to, to live a life with, with unhindered vision. In other words, you continue to work through the places where you struggle. You continue to, to, to ask the Lord to create in you a clean heart. You continue to look for opportunities um, to, to use whatever gifts you've been given in service and in leadership to others. And, you know, it's, it's like scripture says, do not grow weary in doing good. So um, yeah, it's a different, it's a different dynamic. I think when you've been in it for a minute, um, and one of the things I ask the Lord a lot is like, Lord, I don't, I, please, I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be cynical because yes. you, you see things, you know, mm-hmm. things, you hear things. Uh, life does not always work out like we think it should. But I think Moses is such a good reminder that a life of leadership is a whole life. Yeah. And um, it's a, it's hopefully Lord willing, a long life. And uh, we don't want to waste a second of it. Mm-hmm. That's good. 
And you talk about your sweet mama. That's how you actually yes. wrap up the book and share how she was an example of leadership to you. And I loved that because, you know, it's a different vision of leadership than maybe what we're told to strive for sometimes. Right. So will you share yeah. a, share with us about her and about that. Yeah, I think, you know, my mama would have never called herself a leader, right? Like she just would have said, I'm not, a, I'm not a leader. And I think it, when, we, when we do that, um, one, I get it, you know, because we think, well, I'm just living my life. But if you have influence over one other person, uh, you're a leader. If you have the opportunity to call one other person to hire and better, you're leading. And mama had such a, a knack for, for welcoming people and for making mm -hmm. them feel at home. So I watched her lead in those ways my whole life. Um, she was undeterred uh, by, by the size of a crowd. She was undeterred by a, a recipe that was tricky to convert to large numbers. Like she was a determined leader in that way. But more specifically, Mama in the 70s, and I grew up in Mississippi, Mama got really interested in yoga and calisthenics, which, I mean, y'all can appreciate in the 70s in Mississippi, this was not <laughs> maybe like the norm. And one of the things she did with that, because she loved, uh, she loved helping people take care of themselves. She loved encouraging people to take care of themselves. And so one of the things that she did was she started these exercise classes. She called them interdenominational ladies exercise classes. <laughs> and uh, she, she, she did these exercise classes in church fellowship halls, you know, in different churches in my hometown. But one of my enduring memories about that was that mama's desire for people to feel welcome carried over into that. And so the town where I grew up, obviously it's the town of Mississippi had a lot of churches. We also had a large Jewish population in my hometown and mama was so um, mindful and so determined that her Jewish friends would feel as welcome in, in that particular faith space as her Christian friends did. And I just think, man, we to see them. She were ahead of your time mm -hmm. in terms of, of really being intentional and mindful about the best ways you could love people as you led them in that particular context. I, y'all, this did not occur to me, honestly, until I was writing this book. But I was like, okay, mama, a little bit of a revolutionary thing <laughs> in terms of um, just being in her own way, kind of radically determined to um, love people in as best she could in all the ways she could. And that is leadership. And so it was really sweet. Uh, as I got to the end of the book, to see that that in my real life, the person who had taught me the most about what Moses teaches, teaches us in scripture um, were my parents, you know, mm. in different ways. But man, both of them leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a gift that is just to see your passion and hear that, um, just that honor in your voice of saying my parents oh. were leaders and they Absolutely. wouldn't say they stood out in that. but for you to honor them in this way. To, exactly. Want to. oh and God. I think that that maybe is where we have to check ourselves a little bit now is because now I think we do associate leadership with a certain degree of notoriety uh -huh. or a certain degree of um, being seen, but in a public way. And I'm really grateful for that example of leadership in the day to day, right where you live, right where you are. Uh, nobody has to know about it. Nobody has to document it. Um, and, and, and nobody has to sing public praises for it. Right. But, yeah. but their faith informed mama and daddy, both their faith informed how they walked out what they were called to do. And, and, oh my goodness, you know, I think that's transformative. Yeah. So your book kind of, um, it sparks the Bible nerd in me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you talked about some women that were instrumental in Moses' life. Could you share yes. a little bit more about that? Yeah, that was actually that day when I was on that flight to Houston. That was the thing that jumped out at me. I mean, you start, you have midwives named Shipra and Pua who were, who were brave enough to defy Pharaoh when he first said, you know, when, when uh, the Hebrew women birthed, you know, boys were, were going to, were going to get rid of them. And they were like, nope, not doing it. But the, the main thing, there are, the, there are three women very, very, very early in Moses' life. His, his mother, whose name was Jochebed, 
uh, his sister Miriam, and then Pharaoh's daughter. And in mm-hmm. scripture says specifically, all three of these women saw, they saw different things. Jacob had saw that Moses was a fine baby, mm-hmm. um, but, but yet Pharaoh had mandated that, you know, he had to be put in the Nile. Uh, Miriam, when Jacob had finally did put Moses in the Nile after she had hit him for a little while, uh, Miriam stood back and, and, and saw that happen and saw Pharaoh's daughter arrive on the scene and saw Pharaoh's daughter see Moses. There's all this seeing. Everybody's sort of watching everything. And when, when Miriam sees Pharaoh's daughter see Moses, she approaches her. And that's when they work out an arrangement where Moses is going to go back to Jacobid. He's he's going to be raised by his mother, who a lot of people who write commentary think that, that Moses's mother knew God. Um, and so he's going to get to be raised by his mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter says, you know, I'll, I'll take him when he gets older. But all three of those women specifically see uh, Moses. They specifically see his situation. And then they work together uh, to save his life. And so it's interesting because right after that, the first thing scripture tells us is that when Moses grew up, he walked outside and he saw an Egyptian fighting with a Hebrew. So he's learned to see too, but he just, the, the first instance we see of him seeing, he doesn't use his sight redemptively. Also all of us, right? Mm-hmm. We all have instances where we haven't used our sight redemptively. Um, but that seeing of those of those women really marks his life. And so you have that on the front end of his life. And then for, for the, the, the back side of his life, to mention that his vision was unhindered, I was like, oh, my word, there is a whole thing to see here mm-hmm. about seeing as far as leadership goes. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, well, we're so glad that you got to be with us today, and we would love to know how people can find you in this book, A Fine Sight to See. Well, uh, y'all are very kind to have me, so thank you for that. Sure. And uh, also, maybe y'all can relate that uh, I did not I did not attend the day of social media school where all your <laughs> handles are supposed to match. <laughs> so uh, probably the best way is on Instagram, which is Mama 205 I'm on Facebook too, but it's so long. I'm not even going to say it. Uh, and then Melanie and I, my friend Melanie and I do a podcast every week called the Big Boo Cast, like I mentioned. And uh, it's it's wherever podcasts are. So yeah. that's a great way to find us. Well, yeah. can I can I wrap this up with one last question? I want you sure. to imagine that there is a young woman sitting across from you and you are having coffee with her. Susie, this is going to make me cry, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and she feels that call to leadership, but there's so many voices in her head. And I want you to see her and I want you to talk to her and just tell her something as we wrap this up. Yeah. I would say God has gifted you so intentionally and he has gifted you on purpose. And all, all these inclinations you feel um, to, to sort of get out there and get after it, as my mama would have said, um, like you get to do that. And you, and I, and, and here's the other thing. Absolutely. We've got to have boundary lines, right? They're going to be different in different contexts. Um, and, and we got to figure out how we respond to those boundary lines in the places where we worship and live and serve. Um, and that's going to, that's going to look different depending on where we are, but here's what I'm going to say. You get to run free. Mm-hmm. You get to run free and you get to operate in the fullness of the ways that the Lord has made you. So I would say you surround yourself with, with women who affirm and esteem uh, mm-hmm. your life, your leadership, your passions. Um, I would say you, you dig as deep as you can in terms of ruthlessly self-inventory to see if there's anything that's hindering your sight, your vision, um, your ability to really see other people for who they are. And then uh, as much as you know how, you start, you just start walking through the doors that the Lord would open for you and you get low. Um, and, and as you serve from a place that is humble, um, that is full of affection for God's people, um, you will lead. And, and, and ultimately the goal of any leadership, I think for a believer is that it's one for the good of the group. It's rooted and grounded in love, like Ephesians three tells us, and God would get every bit of that glory. So uh, I think the last thing probably I would say to her is go, Mm -hmm. go. 
You go. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. We treasure you. Thank you for um, 20 plus years of pouring into other women. Um, <laughs> it, it matters, Sophie. Thank it matters you, what you've done. Well, so thank you, thank you for everything you've done. Because if you don't think there haven't been days when I have gotten away from myself and you have shared a little nugget on Twitter and I go, okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. Dial Thank it you. Back, sister, dial it back. <laughs> Not because I don't want to be honest. But because ultimately, maybe what I had to say or what I was thinking just was not helpful. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for uh, that example. It, mm -hmm. it really does mean a lot. Well, I'm over on threads now, so come join me. <laughs> 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 All right. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank and so we love much. you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for going deeper, becoming freer, and connecting with us. More Than Small Talk is a part of the KLRC Podcast Network and is produced by Kara Culver. Show notes and resources are available on the More Than Small Talk page on klrc.com. You can also join us in our Facebook group. Subscribe to More Than Small Talk on your favorite app so you won't ever miss an episode.